air is full of nitrogen, oxygen, light, clouds, wind, pollution, radio, airplanes, satellites, signals, dust, birds, and more. You see Parika's talk, some people say not to worry about the air. We'll address questions about the air, pollution, and the various political, media, theoretical, and material context in which it is registered. Dr. Yusi Parika is professor at the Winchester School of Art, the University of Southampton, and docent of digital culture theory at the University of Tuku in Finland. In his various books, he addresses a critical understanding of network culture, aesthetics, and media archaeology of contemporary society. Please welcome. Mm, wonderful. Unfortunately, um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Unfortunately, the best line of my talk was already given so in the introduction, so the rest of it will be down, downhill. Um, I wrote something on geology of media, which is probably the reason why you put me in a panel about the Anthropocene or inhabiting the Anthropocene. Um, but I'm going to talk about something lighter, even if not disconnected from geologies of media. The ways in which I think about geologies of media is not only about solids or tectonic plates and all that, it's about elements. Perhaps pre-Socratic, but not merely so. Some people say not to worry about the air. Some of you might even notice the reference. So, to be on time, I'll start. How does the future look like? No, but really, how does the future, the near future, look like as if it was an image? as if it was an image that can be perceived and analyzed, approached as an image of time passing and the elements of time passing. Perhaps the question does not even make sense if we operate within a restricted notion of an image, except given the usual response to, well, look at science fiction, look at forms of simulations and scenarios which have been part of the epistemological weaponry of future mapping. We have various images of the future since the Cold War, at least. Because this was the business of knowing the uncertain future since the Cold War. The various maps and schemes, preparation and scenarios that prepared for the worst to come. And now we know the worst arrived. Operational research was a way to mobilize game theory and different mathematical models to sort out potential reactions for indeed the near future and the apocalypse to come. If it's an image, the near future image comes out as imaginaries. It comes out as imaginaries of polluted landscapes and the various series of aggregated images where pollution or climate change crystallizes into something perceptible. It comes out as images that seem to refer to this. It comes out as the gas mask, the aerial image, the drowned cityscape, the panorama of waste spread across fields of some unnamed Global South location. The so-called Anthropocene image, perhaps, is easily one that le lends itself to an aesthetics or even an aesthetics or aestheticization of the destruction within a moral economy of shock and disgust, which retains distance from any sense of how to operate within this ecology of images. So actually, perhaps we should be asking, what do you do with the near future? What do you do about the near future? It is very hard to avoid a certain apocalyptic mood that pertains to contemporary fiction and other cultural product products. This apocalyptic mood applies to certain bits of theory as well. The sense of apocalypse cool 
pertains to the Anthropocene and its manifestations across the board, especially in some versions of the dark inhumanities, of worlds without humans and other human fantasies, and the level playing field for objects to all a bit flat. There is no need to rehearse those arguments for the sake of academic introductions, but instead to use the time we have to develop a different strand of thought, because there are alternatives. The other type of non-human discourse is somewhat more historically attuned, recognizing how it was always anyway a rather significant epistemological battle to map the fringes of what counts as human and what not, a question with the broad range of repercussions from legal issues to indeed human rights, and what is always left out. Left out of this history of the human as part of these images as operational social legal landscapes. Thus, as some versions of post-human thought, like that of Rosie Braidotsis has been arguing, it is actually through lessons in feminist and post-colonial theory that we should investigate also questions of what else than just the human should be part of the theoretical vocabulary that gives an insight to the material contexts of our ethics, aesthetics, and biopolitics. Indeed, enough questions for one seminar, well, enough questions for one lifetime, depending which species lifetime. The near future image is one of shifting scales, a theme picked up by other colleagues already so many times in so many fruitful ways. For example, Joanna Zielinska starts to build her argument concerning the Anthropocene through a reference to the minimal ethics of Theodore Adorno, but also in relation to feminist theory. How to build such positions that, in her words, I quote, philosophizing as if against all odds, to look for signs of life in the middle of an apocalypse. Indeed, we ask whose threats? Whose apocalypse was it already and whose scales are questions relevant to our near future narratives too? Ones that start to become more operational than just aesthetics of something to look at. Besides the questions are perhaps obvious, Perhaps the obvious questions as to whose narratives and where narratives are locating, it is also who's near. What is near in the case where the horizon of near is probably already too near. The current prospect of three degrees of planetary warming that would cause massive sea level rise could indeed, as they say, and put it in the headlines, take decades or more than a century. It could or could not, according to the rather still open scientific estimates, but yet, as we pretty much still know, prepare for the worst. The year 20, 2100, a suitably sci-fi year, no, is often floated as one horizon for one threshold of times to come, but of course, the near future is sometimes really near. The desolated wastelands and polluted rivers as the after effect of industrialization and the resource extraction in vast areas or broadly speaking the global south and in those various disadvantaged areas of global cities worldwide where as we know pollution follows the route of poverty in ways that is not just magical, it is just capitalism. The near future is too near. It's always too near. As for decades, megacities have been defined by their toxic breathing air due to the massive load of air pollution that is not merely the issue of places out there, Beijing, Ankara, Mexico City, etc. But these are the ones that are close to Western homes. The by now, the cinematic past image of the smog London is replaced by the, such, by the amount of um, PM2.5 particles where According to WHO, 95% of the capital is, is exceeding guidelines by, the, by at least 50%. It is too small to be noticed and to be cinematic. It does spur, however, a range of technological operations through which, developing, through which we see it, from developing real-time satellite-based maps to other measures which form an image of air. From the projections of near future apocalypse out there, it becomes perhaps rather urgent to investigate the non-human in here. 
both geographically as well as toxically so close to so close to current concerns that fold a different sense of time than just about the future. This nearness is so close as the planetary transformation as a lived quality that is inhaled as a toxic cloud that itself is one central visual cue for this situation. What image is the one that speaks of toxicity? What image, image speaks of toxics of the near now and does not look like much? These geological connotations, concepts and metaphors used for the Anthropocene discourse must also include the broader elementals involved in transformations of the sensoria itself. Because it's not only what we see, what we project, what we visualize and see as an image, but that this perception to inhabit the Anthropocene, this perception, the sensing, the experiencing is itself involved in the transformation it speaks about. We are in that toxic cloud. And it comes out as a different sort of a picture than the one of about earth tectonics or clearly visible distribution of solids. Perhaps in so some ways, it is closer to what conceptual art invented early on. Think of the air conditioning show of 66 and 67 by Terry Atkinson and Michael Baldwin, how it framed the possibility of air itself, itself as an odd aesthetic object, of course, admittedly, in relation to the gallery system, art language, and art writing. And that way shifted the perceptual attention despite this immediate imperceptibility to see air one is tempted to take the air show as a cue for the near future image and the elements too. One that shifts attention, but also in this case, on a very molecular level, starts to transform the body that is observing. But the scale is somewhat different to that of the gallery. Instead, the one that we're dealing with, this air show, is of at atmospheric dimensions, like more recent art projects, have demonstrated. Amy Balkin's much later Atmosphere a Guide does it in contemporary context as a poster essay. From the sea level to the exosphere to the air and the atmosphere is full of activity, from geopolitics to satellites, pollution to just big chunks of metal that is the remnant of the Cold War. Or then J.R. Carpenter's creative writing, the gathering cloud book that relates the longer duration of what's up in the sky and how we know about things up in the sky. Sending balloons, drawing images, making up typologies of clouds and more. Air is full of words about air. Images, engravings, and other media that try to catch up with the dynamic movement of up there, down here. In other words, there is more in the air and the sky than meets the eye. High up above our heads, the air is full of nitrogen, oxygen, light, clouds, wind, pollution, radio, airplanes, satellites. It is full of signal traffic. It is full of dust and birds and more. Back on the level of eyes, nostrils, and skin, it touches more than the eye. Instead, it is inhaled, enters the body as a haptic environment. It is the haptic environment. They inhabit what we inhabit in which one sees. Of course, there would be a longer metaphysical story. There would be metaphysical dimensions to ponder. Think of Luce Eric Garay's reminder that philosophers such as Martin Heidegger were all too focused on the earth and they forgot about the air. But it also, of course, it is something that lends itself into a pop song. Hence, take Talking Heads and the album Fear of Music as our cue. Some 10 years later, after the air conditioning show, and a few years before, Luz Erigere takes on Heidegger. What is happening to my skin? Where is that protection that I needed? Air can hurt you too. Some people say not to worry about the air. Some people never had experience with air. Fair enough. We might not want to mistake the Talking Head song, Air, from the album in 1979 as a note about anthropogenic climate change and air pollution, but it does set the tone in useful ways. 
it speaks to a set of concerns that Peter Slaughter Dyke coined as Atmo Terror, the weaponization of air from the battle trenches of World War I to greenhouse gas effects, and the recent massive shift in the carbon oxygen cycle. The flip side of Le Corbusier's modernist dream of exact air, of sending ex exact air into men's lungs at home, at the factory, at the office, at the club, and the auditorium. The flip side is the production of bad air. That the air can hurt you too is one version of what Rob Nixon coined as the slow violence that unfolds not as one massive explosion, not as one visible accident, but it is more akin to a series of events whose effect accumulates in the long run. If it's an image, it is close to the conceptual art legacy, but on a scale that builds up into planetary dimensions, an image of slow suffocation. But it becomes visible. It becomes visible in transformations. The skin and surface registers the suffocation across multiple scales. The transformation of the sensorium is what characterizes this transformative image as haptic, a weird sort of a chemical moving image, if I may. It involves chemistry as the description of the transformation of the various scales of interaction that moves from experience and affect to the non-organic mutation that defines one scale of the elemental planet. The near future image forms on the cancerous skin as epidermal reaction. It registers on lungs in the case of air pollution. It is inscribed in plankton, animals, and much more widely than just for the human eyes. It is an image that is a chemical reaction. So hence, we can speak of this weird period in art historical terms. It is a period of light media that is visible in different ways than art history has recognized. The alternative art history will then talk about such things as photochemical smog, invisible air pollution, or then ultraviolet radiation, a planetary scale art historical period that emerges around 1970s gradually. In any case, it's hard to dispute that chemistry is the apt form of knowledge worthy of being included in this imaginary, of, imaginary canon of conceptual art of the Anthropocene. And besides a specific field of knowledge, chemistry becomes a vehicle to discuss the near future image that is constantly and remains unseen and yet so transformative. It is indeed a mix of things. It is a mix of things of elementals and the temptation to go all pre-Socratic for elements is pronounced. Earth, fire, air, water as the forces of also contemporary life worlds, while the more recent and the more accurate reference point would be of course Mendeleev's periodic table from the late 19th century onwards as the start of a one conceptual art period way before its time. It marks a place for that what cannot be seen. So besides this over-enthusiastic art historical revisionism, the periodic table is a place where science, media, and modern modes of production meet. So if you want to stick with the four elements for the sake of philosophical elegance or continuity, let's at least make it something that is suitable to our situation. Hence take Gary Ganosko's suggestion for the new four elements as something else than cliched rehashing of Greek philosophy. This version of the new four is actually already about the multiplied combinatorics, x to the power of four, and speaks to a whole different bundle of contemporary issues of synthetic worlds, of art and politics and well indeed of waste. As Genosco explains, the four elements should not be taken as a description of how the world ontologically is, but as a way to understand production, the productive elements, the gener generative forces that constitute these weird worlds. So the variations of the four elements start to produce odd combinations. We live in a world where air is combustible, waters that are infused with heavy metals, and other variations that are ways to narrate post-natural forces and substances. Well, while to say that the near future is about post-natural is mostly a truism from contemporary theory, 
it does actually refer to a longer duration of entry of chemistry as part of the modern world, as part of modern modes of production and aesthetics since the 19th century. From mines and mining to Fritz Haber to pesticides, what not, but a post-natural management of the so-called nature we have been dealing with since the 19th century. Hence, to continue with Genosco, the new four elements and their thousands of variations. This as one sort of an attempt. Earth, dust, water, blood, air, lethal fogs, fire, flammables. Wrap around these elements is the planetary phylum, a great Tellurian cable bunch with its own products. Earth, electronics, water, liquidities, like water bottles in plastic, which throws forward diagrammatic intensities into explosion of plastic debris. Air, gas, gases, greenhouse, fire, smoldering car tires, slashed rainforests, seasonal wildfires in the great northern forests. The Anthropocene might be a rather bad term, but one should think of it as a passage to these transformations. The elements transformed make us worry about the air, the, the water, fire, earth, but also the sensorium of humans and others that is involved in this situation. How impossible it is to keep distance with, from the air. How impossible it is to keep distance from the near future and other temporal projections that are somewhat already now and that are somewhat already here. Thank you.